My name is Rabiatul Sinatunisa binti Wasali. My metric number is 05PAT18F2993. I am from class DAT2F section 1. Hi everyone, my name is Fatma El Zahra binti Majuri. My metric number is 05PAT18F2995. And I am from class DAT2B section 2. Hi, my name is Diane Kuhilato Hashikin Aliwin and my metric number is 05DAT18F2994 and I am from class DAT2B section 2. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all viewers. My name is Rabi Atul. I will be the moderator for today. So, before we, we begin our discussion, I will be introducing our two panelists. Our first panelist is Miss Dayang Tu. Our second panelist is Miss Fatma. Without further ado, let's start with the forum. The topic we will be discussing today is the five elements of valid contract. A contract can be interpreted as an agreement enforceable by law. To have a valid contract, it should have certain important elements such as as offer, acceptance, consideration, free consent, and capacity. We will start with Ms. Dayang Ku to explain the elements of a valid contract. Thank you to Ms. Rabiatul as the moderator for today and also thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to share some of the elements of a valid contract. So firstly, I would be explaining an offer. In Section 2, Clause A of the Contract Act 1950 states that when one person signifies to answer his willingness to do or to abstain from doing anything with a view to obtaining the assent of that other to such act or abstinence, he is said to make a proposal. So here you can see proposal has the same meaning as offer. In Section 2, Clause B of the Contract Act 1950 states that when the person to whom the proposal is made signifies his assent thereto, the proposal is said to be accepted. A proposal, when accepted, becomes a promise. Note that the person to whom the proposal is made can only accept the proposal. Other persons cannot purport to accept the proposal. According to Section 2, Clause C, of the Contract Act 1950, the person making the proposal is called the promiser and the person accepting the proposal is called the promisee. And in Section 9 of the Contract Act 1950 states that so far as the proposal or acceptance of any promise is made in words, the promise is said to be expressed. So far as the proposal or acceptance is made otherwise than in words, the promise is said to be implied. There are two types of offer, which is specific offer and general offer. Specific offer is a more to a specific individual by means only the addressee may accept the offer. For general offer, it is more public, so the addressee to any who may satisfy all the terms and conditions of the offer stipulated by the offer may accept the offer. Is there any case that we can refer from them? General offer that you have shared? Yes, there is. It is Cargo versus Carbolic Smokeball Company. So, uh, the second element is uh, acceptance. If there is an offer, there must be an acceptance. Section 2B, Section 2, Clause B of the Contract Act 1950, as said by Ms. Dayanku earlier, means that the acceptor or whom the offer is made agrees or accepts the offer made by the offerer. Once there is an acceptance, an agreement between the parties is created. A contract exists and it is binding upon the parties. There are conditions for acceptance. The acceptance must be made by the offeree or, accept or acceptor must satisfy certain conditions. If the conditions are not met or fulfilled, such uh, acceptance would not be valid and thus the contract is not binding or valid. The conditions are First, acceptance must be ever dispensed with the need of communication of acceptance. 
first when there is an offer to the public. Second one is reciprocal promises and acceptance through posts. Acceptance through posts. Section 4, clause 2 of Contract Act 1950 states that communication of acceptance by post is complete as against the overall when it is when it is put in the course of transmission to him so as to be out of the course of the acceptor as against the acceptor when it is comes to the knowledge of the offerer the offerer is bound to a contract made through post even though he does not know about the acceptance the acceptor is bound by the contract only when the acceptance has reached the knowledge of the offerer the third element of a valid contract is pre-consent. In section 14 of Contract Act 1950 states that a contract is made by the mutual agreement between the parties out of their own free will. In section 13 of Contract Act 1950, there must be meeting of minds as to the nature and scope of the contract. If the agreement is not achieved by the free consent of one or both of the parties, then there is no consensus at either or meeting of the minds. Such a situation may arise where there are unequal bargaining powers. Question is the committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by the penal code or the unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person whatever with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement. In section 23, states that a contract is not voidable merely because it was caused by one of the parties to it being under a mistake as to a matter of fact. Section 21 and section 23 read together mean that if both parties contracted under a common mistake of essential fact, a contract is void. But if only one party contracted under a mistake of essential fact, the contract is valid and binding. Now, note that the mistake concern is mistake as to fact, thus mistake of judgment, for example, as to the quality of the goods, which results in making a bad bargain will not render the contract void if all relevant facts are revealed. In Section 16 of Contract Act 1950, undue influence can be defined as a contract is said to be induced by undue influence where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that of one of the parties is in a position to dominate the will of the other and uses that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. In particular and without prejudice to the generality, generality of the foregoing principle, a person is deemed to be in a position to dominate the will of another where he holds a real or apparent authority over the other or where he stands in a fidu fiduciary relation to the other or where he makes a contract with a person whose mental capacity is temporarily or permanently affected by reason of age, illness or mental or bodily distress. Lastly, for mistake, you can refer to section 21 of Contract Act 1950 states that where both the parties to an agreement are under a mistake as to a matter of fact essential to the agreement. The agreement is void. The elements of mistake is the mistake must be made by both parties. The mistake is relating to a matter of fact essential to the agreement. Sorry, Ed. So uh, the second element is uh, acceptance. If there is an offer, there must be an acceptance. Section 2B, Section 2, Clause B of the Contract Act 1950, as said by Ms. Dayanku earlier, means that the acceptor or whom the offer is made agrees or accepts the offer made by the offerer. Once there is an acceptance, an agreement between the parties is created. A contract exists and it is binding upon the parties. There are conditions for acceptance. 
The general rule is that the acceptance must be communicated to the offeror, as said in Section 2, Clause B and Section 4, Clause 2 of Contract Act 1950. Therefore, mere intention to accept without communicating the acceptance does not give rise to a valid and binding contract. This is important because the promiser can always revoke uh, or cancel his offer before there is an acceptance, but not after. The most important thing is silence is not an acceptance. The offeror may not put any condition in his offer that the silence of the offeree would giving any positive acceptance amounted to an acceptance. Amounted to an acceptance. It is because the general rule is that acceptance must be communicated to the offeror. The acceptance would only be valid if there is a positive conduct signifying the acceptance. The conditions are First, acceptance must be absolute and unqualified. The acceptance must be made exactly on the same terms as offered without any modification. Section 7, Clause A said that any modification of the terms of the offer amounts to counter-offer. Counter-offer is treated as a rejection of the original offer and therefore there is no valid acceptance exists. Second, acceptance must be communicated in some usual and reasonable manner. Section 7, Clause B says that the communication of the acceptance must be usual and reasonable. However, if there is a mode of acceptance prescribed by the offeror, it must be followed by the offeree. The offeror is entitled to refuse the acceptance made by the offeree, which is not in, in, not in accordance with the prescribed mode of acceptance. Uh, the next element is consideration. Consideration, uh, as stated in Section 2, Clause D of Contract Act 1950, uh, when at the desire of the promisor, the promisee or any other person has done or abstained from doing or does or abstain from doing or promises to do or to abstain from doing something such as act or abstinence or promise is called a consideration for the promise. So the meaning is uh, consideration is something which has a value in the eyes of law and it becomes the basis of the contract. It is a price it is a it is a price which is paid by one party in return to a promise or act done by another party. It means merely the price is a bargain. The price need not to be money but must be a monetary value. So there are three categories of consideration. First, executory consideration. The second is executed consideration and the third is the past consideration. The, net the last element is capacity. In order to form a valid and binding contract, the contracting parties must have the capacity to enter into a contract. Every person is free to enter into a contract so as long as he is competent or having the capacity to contract. Section 10, Clause 1 uh, of Contract Act 1950 states that all agreements are contract if they are made by the free consent of parties competent to contract for a lawful consideration and with a lawful object and are not hereby expressly declared to be void. There are limitations to contractual capacity. There are certain limitations upon the capacity of persons to enter a contract. Section 11 states that every person is competent to contract who is of the age of majority according to the law to which he is subject and who is of sound mind and is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject. 
by virtue of these sections, the following persons are not competent to enter into a contract. If he is a minor or infant, he, if he is insane or drunken persons, and if he is bankrupt. So, today, as we had heard from our two panelists, we can conclude that these five elements are very important to form a valid contract. Without these elements, a contract can neither be binded. To close our forum, I would like to thank our panelists for giving their time to share their thoughts for the topic we have today.